Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Options Selling with a Purpose. Today's presenter is Carly Garner. Ms. Garner is Senior Market Strategist, Broker, and Author with the Carly Trading. Welcome, Carly. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. My name is Tom Hartle. I am CQG's Director of Product Training, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them into the Q&A section window at any time during the presentation. We'll have Carly answer the questions at the end of her presentation. If you are viewing the presentation in full screen mode, you can find the Q&A in the WebEx toolbar at the top of your screen in the drop-down menu on the far right. If you're having any sound issues, please contact the host via WebEx chat. We'll be recording today's webinar and it will be posted within 48 hours to the events section on news.cqg.com. All registered attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest presenter. Carly Gardner has 10 years experience as a futures broker, excuse me, futures and options broker with Carly Trading, a division of Zeno Group. She is also author of three books, a trader's first book on commodities, currency trading in the forex and futures markets, and commodity options. She publishes two e-newsletters, the DeCarly Perspective and Financial Futures Report. She is also active in providing free trading education. Carly has been featured in multiple trading magazines and news publications, and her market analysis is often referenced on Jim Cramer's Mad Money on CNBC. Welcome, Carly, and now it's my pleasure to turn the webinar over to you. Thanks a lot. Tom, uh, like I said, it's a pleasure to be here. This is actually a great opportunity for, for myself. I've always been aware of CQG, and I've used uh, their platform you know, for futures trading and things like that, but this is the first time I was really introduced to the option side of CQG, and I, I've got to admit, uh, they have some really great stuff, and so I'm kind of excited to show you guys some of the things um, that it does, in, in addition to some of the things that, as far as market analysis um, you know, some of the things that we look for option, as an option seller, some of the things that we look for in the markets, and we uh, apply that to the CQG platform, and it's actually, it's pretty cool stuff. So let's get started. Just in case you have any questions or comments or anything about the class today, feel free to contact me. Here's my phone number, my email address. Um, if you're interested in some of the things that we talk about, and you want to learn more about option trading, you can go to our website, thecarlytrading.com. We also post a lot of um, you know, comments and sample newsletters and all that kind of stuff on Facebook and Twitter. So if you do the social network thing, hopefully we see you there. And it's my obligation to tell you that uh, there is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options. It's not suitable for everybody. Uh, there's, a, there's a saying out there that says, trading options can be hazardous to your wealth, and uh, that can absolutely be true. Trading is not an easy, an easy game, but hopefully some of the things that we talk about today will steer you in the right direction and give you some tips and tricks on how to avoid being a statistics, because we all know that um, the bottom line is most people lose trading futures and options. So we want to make sure we're in the, you know, the 20% of the of the market participants that are making money as opposed to the 80% or, or whatever it is. Those are just rough estimates that are losing. But uh, again, hopefully we can show you some things to keep you on the right side of the, the tracks here. First, let's talk about just the basic overview of short options. If you've uh, been around trading for a while, you probably know some of this stuff, but I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page once, once we get into the good stuff. Option selling really gets a, a bad rap. If you mention it to people, they squint and they, you know, they get nervous, especially risk managers at some of the brokerage firms. It's just not a popular trading methodology. Now, uh, in my opinion, some of the disdain for option selling is really unfounded. In fact, I think if you open the door and, you know, think outside of the box, you'll find that option selling actually offers really good odds of success. And it can, um, you know, take some of the, the guesswork out of, out of trading and also give you room for error. We all know as a futures trader, there's really little room for error. You get in the market, you're either right or you're wrong, and there's really no in-between. As an option trader, there's a lot of in-between. So 
some of the things that people don't like about option selling is that it offers limited reward and unlimited risk. And on the surface, that doesn't sound good, right? But if you think about it, it's not unlike a lot of the things in your life. When you buy car insurance, you're paying a premium every month or every six months, whatever it is your, your plan is. And the odds of you getting anything back are slim to none, but in option trading is the same thing. An option buyer, they have limited risk and limited re and unlimited reward, but their limited risk, which is the premium they're paying for options, is probably not very likely to pay out for them. As an option seller, you're taking the other side of that play. You're being the insurance company or you're being the casino, and it's true, sometimes you're gonna have to pay out jackpots, but hopefully over time, you collect enough premium to overcome the big payouts that eventually you will have to make. Also, you know, margin calls are really not a fun thing to, to be involved in, uh, but it does happen. As it, a lot of people don't sell options because they're scared of margin calls. Margin calls are not something to be scared of. I'd like to call them just a friendly reminder from your brokerage firm that maybe you're overdoing it a little bit and maybe you need to adjust your positions. Now, if you're, if you're selling options, you should really keep a big cushion in your account. I like to tell people about 50% of your account should be free, uh, you know, margin excess. And if you do that, you're probably not going to get very many margin calls, but they will happen. And, of course, we've all heard the stories of uh, account draining losses. You know, option sellers, they sell an option for a couple hundred dollars, and next thing you know, they blow out their, their account. And those types of things are possible, and they can happen, but hopefully... Uh, we'll show you some a few ways to, to not be that person, not be that guy. Okay, what is a short option? Well, if, you, if you're selling a call, you're bearish. Call writers are receiving an income. This is, option selling is an income strategy. They're receiving an income or an option premium in return for the liability of honoring the option buyer's right to buy the futures contract at a specific strike price at a specific point in the future. If exercised, the call seller is obligated to sell the futures at the strike price. Now, what this means in English is, let's say, for example, if you're an S&P trader and you decide you want to sell, uh, you think the, the S&P is not going any higher, and you sell a 1900 call, okay? What you're doing is basically you're collecting premium, or, um, well, let's, let's look at it from the other side of the coin at first. The option buyer, that call buyer, the person that's buying the 1900 call for you, they're betting that they, the S&P will be above 1900 at expiration. So they're willing to pay money up front for the option or the right to buy the futures contract at 1900. Of course, that option isn't worth anything if the futures price is below 1900. So at that point, the option is going to expire worthless. So the buyer is betting that a certain event will happen but the seller of the option is betting that it will not happen. And so they're taking the premium up front. The only way for the seller to lose money is if that event actually does happen. So, I mean, we'll show you this on a chart, and you'll get a much better idea of what we're talking about here, but you'll see that the odds of success for an option seller are far better than that of an option buyer. Now, the one downside of being an option seller is even if you're really, really right about the direction of the market or about the future, you're still only going to make what you collected in premium. You're not going to hit the big home run that an option buyer, an option buyer might score. But in the long run, I think, uh, you know, I like to say base hits win the game, and I think that's probably what you'll find with this type of a strategy. Obviously, a, a put is the exact opposite. So if, if somebody's selling a put, it's a bullish strategy. You're looking for the market to – either go up, preferably, or at the very least, not go down any further, or trade sideways. The thing that we're gonna show you in a minute is, option sellers really don't have to be right. They can be wrong and still make money. And the reason being, right here, it's a, an eroding liability. An option is an eroding asset. So if you're a seller of that option, it's an eroding liability. Every day that goes by, the option buyer is losing money while the option seller is making money, assuming that the futures price isn't going against them.
options erode similar to the value of your car. When you buy a car and you drive it off the lot, it automatically drops in value. Options do the exact same thing. In fact, it's really the identical scenario. When you buy an option, you're automatically losing money because you paid the bid-ask spread to get in. Now, in a liquid market, it's not that big of a deal. In an illiquid market, like copper or coffee, it is a big deal. Sometimes you, you buy your option, you're already down a couple hundred bucks. On top of that, as time goes by, if the event that you thought was going to happen does not happen, your options lose value. It's not uncommon for an option buyer to be right about the market direction, but they're not right enough and they lose money. That's just an example of how options erode. Uh, studies have been done, and it's give or take. You know, there's no specific numbers. Some people come up with 90% and some people come up with 70, but somewhere in that ballpark, approximately 80% of options expire worthless. So you can, right there, you can see being an option buyer is a challenging proposition. The biggest reason that I think traders should look at a short option trading strategy is there's ample room for error. Option sellers can be dead wrong and still make money. I, I know I said that a few minutes ago, but I want to make sure you, you understand that. And we're going to show you that on a chart as well. Actually, this chart. We, option sellers don't have to be perfect. For example, this trader, this is a hypothetical, but uh, this trader notices that the market's coming down here against the support line in the euro, and this is a while ago. This is maybe a couple months ago. And actually, I believe uh, this trade did work out. But let's assume that the trader believes the euro is in an uptrend, the market sold off a little bit, it's near support, and so they've got a couple things they could do. They could either buy a call option, they could buy a futures contract, or they could sell a put. Now, with a futures contract or a call option, the market has to immediately go in their favor for them to make money. Otherwise, they're in drawdown scenario, or even if they're not necessarily wrong and the market trades sideways, it's not going up. Their call options losing value, so they're still losing. But an option seller actually gives themselves quite a bit of room to be wrong. You'll, you'll notice it up here, the description, but uh, basically what we're doing here is the seller of a, a 131 put, and you notice right the market's around 134.5 when this trade is hypothetically executed. The max profit would occur as long as the euro is above 131, which is the strike price of the put that you're selling, you get to keep the entire premium. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I didn't, uh, we're not going to go into how much was collected and so on and so forth, but I can tell you an option with about 30 days, uh, somewhere around three or 400 points out of the money, depending on volatility, you're probably looking at somewhere between 350 and $500. So a trade like that, could potentially net 500 bucks, even if you're wrong by 350 ticks. You can see the market could potentially drop 350 ticks and you still make money. As long as the market's not below this line at expiration, you get to keep your premium. Now, it sounds real easy, right? But it's not necessarily that easy because before expiration, the value of your option is gonna be fluctuating and it can get stressful. So let's say the market drops to 132, it never skips to 131, which is your strike price, but at 132, your option is going to be worth more than what you sold it for, probably. Uh, it's possible that it's not if it slowly drifted down to 132, but if it dropped to 132 quickly, you, you should count on the fact that your option is probably going to be in a drawdown situation. So there's a lot of emotions involved, and we're going to try to give you some tips and tricks on how to keep emotions out of it and what you need to do to, to put yourself in that situation. Now, again, we'll just revisit uh, the profit zone here. When you sell an option, you have unlimited risk. So once the market drops below 131, you're basically kind of like being long a futures contract. Just like when you're in a futures contract, you have unlimited risk. That's what it's like being short a put. On the upside, no matter how right you are, if the euro goes to 143, if it's off the chart, you're still only going to make your three to five hundred dollars, whatever it was you collected for that option. But you know you're never going to get rich on this sort of thing. But the odds are pretty good, right? I mean, look at look at how far the euro would have to fall after it's already fallen several hundred points for you to actually lose on the trade. Who are candidates for option selling? 
While option, sh option sellers should be willing to accept the prospects of unlimited risk and margin calls, if you can't accept the fact that you might go to bed one night and wake up the next morning to a margin call or you know, to some sort of surprise drawdown in your account, then option selling probably isn't for you. You should know, or at least be with a broker who knows, how to manage margin. There's a lot of ways to manage margin other than just wiring money to your account or liquidating positions. As an option seller, sometimes liquidating is the worst thing you can do because as you're selling premium and you're bringing cash into the account, that cash is being used towards your margin. If a trade goes against you and you end up buying those options back at a higher price than you sold them for, you're pulling. Ca you're not only pulling the cash that you collected out of your account, but you're pulling the cash you originally had in there. So you're losing principal, and you're going to put your. You could possibly dig yourself into a bigger hole. Sometimes buying or selling futures contracts or even other options, cheap options with different expiration months in conjunction with your primary position is a better way to adjust your risk and margin than actually just buying positions back or adding money to the account. And again, we mentioned before, you need to be well capitalized. You want to have at least 50% margin to equity ratio. You know, I, sometimes I realize you're going to go a little above that or sometimes a little below, just depending on what's going on, but that's what you're shooting for. And be humble. There is nothing bigger than the markets. We're not smarter. We're not, you know, none of us have unlimited uh, funds backing us. Be humble. If the market's proven you wrong, adjust. Be willing and able to adjust if proven wrong. I've seen a lot of things in my day. Um, I've been around for a while. And I've, I've seen over and over other traders or other uh, people in the business that, that will Hang on to losers, and hey, trust me, I've learned the hard way myself. I've done it, I've done it before too, you know. But yet you're always thinking, you, you sell an option, it goes against you, and you keep thinking, well, it can't possibly get any worse. It can only get better. And guess what? It does get worse. So, you know, I've learned the hard way that uh, always assume that you're wrong when you get into a trade. Assume you're going to be wrong. That way, you're not. It's not so hard to adjust the trade when when necessary especially when you're an option seller and you're you are basically the strategy is as we've discussed limited profit potential and unlimited risk you really don't want to hang on to big losers and let them run like that it's just it's it's really hard to come out of a hole like that okay this is one thing that a lot of option sellers don't do and i'm not saying anything you know if you don't do this maybe I'm not saying it's good or bad I'm just saying this is how my brain works and this is how I think of the markets and selling options I when I look at selling options I like to sell something against the trend okay markets are are trendy they will usually pick a direction and you know the uh, the masses whatever you want to call them I've heard some people call them sheeple but people get excited they start buying into the some sort of theory or some sort of story of a market and once a trend has started sometimes it's hard to to get it going the other way but what i see in a trend is not necessarily uh, for example if i see a market that's consistently going higher i don't necessarily see uh that is something that i want to buy into because that's just not how my personality works and again i'm not saying you have to think like i do you just have to find something that works for you and works for your personality but for me I look at that as an opportunity to look for over, overpriced call options. You'll notice if a market's in, in a consistent uptrend or a consistent downtrend, the options on the other side of that will be overpriced usually. That doesn't mean you can just sell them blindly. For example, um, throughout the last you know, year and a half or so, the S&P has really done nothing but go up. We have... We have not put out, I can't remember the last time I put a recommendation out to sell a put in the S&P. It's probably been a couple of years. We've only sold calls. And you know what? Even though the market's done nothing but go up, we've, we've actually come out ahead. We've had to adjust some. I mean, it was, some of them weren't easy money, that's for sure. But we've, we've come out ahead. And the reason being is we're looking for the, those counter trend opportunities where the market spikes up, the options get overpriced, and then we, that's when we look to sell. So... I like the idea of selling options against the trend, not necessarily with it. When you're selling an option with the trend, you're usually selling it on discount. So it's kind of like if you were a retailer and you had some clothes that weren't moving, you put them on the discount rack. That's what selling options in an uptrend 
or I should say selling puts in an uptrend is like we're selling calls in a downtrend. And sometimes those types of things will work for a long, long time. For instance, we'll take the S&P again. Uh, S&P traders that have been selling puts the last two years, which, like I said, we haven't sold any, you know what? They're doing very well. But there's going to be a day when that comes to an end. You know, I still haven't forgotten May of 2010. I think it was May 6, 2010, the flash crash. The the market was uh, – before that, the market had just consistently – was grinding higher, grinding higher. It was really quiet. Volatility was low. And then one day it was down 150 bucks in a single day. So those types of crazy things can happen when things get lofty. So there's a heck of a lot more risk in trying to sell puts than there are calls. Now, again, it can work for a long, long time, but it's only going to take that one day for things to go wrong. Now, I'm not saying, like, in a market like the S&P, you should only sell calls because that's not true. In fact, like, back in 2008, 2009, when the market was in a, you know, mini crash, that was a good time to sell puts way under the market. You could sell puts in the S&P or 500 points under the market, which is really ridiculous, to be honest. But you get a lot of premium form. So in that type of market condition, it's probably better to be selling puts and not calls. So, again, counter trend trading is potentially uh, at least something to think about. So that you always hear the trend is your friend, right? Well, the trend is your friend as an option seller, but it may be a little bit different than what you might be thinking. And again, um, options are priced to lose. Therefore, as I just said, options in the directions of the current market trend are overvalued. If the market's going up, look for calls. And I'm not saying just going up slowly. What I look for are big spikes up. For example, if crude is rallied, $10, $15 in the last couple of weeks, that's when I start thinking, hey, I might look for some calls deep out of the money. They're probably overpriced. Sometimes you'll see options go from, you know, 10, 10 cents, like, for example, in crude, 10 cents, which is 100 bucks. You'll see them go from 10 cents to 50, 60, 70 cents in a couple of days. And all it takes is, you know, if crude's up $3 one day, $4 the next, boom, the options get really crazy expensive. Those are the ones I look to sell. Now, I'm not saying there's no risk in them, because if we get, if crude's up $10 in a week this week and then it's up $10 next week, things are going to get a little bit stressful. But those types of moves are the exception rather than the rule. And really, the idea is to buy low and sell high. That's the same thing with options. You want to buy cheap options. And you want to sell expensive options. It sounds really, really, really simple and obvious on paper, but it's hard to do because we're humans and we, you know, we have emotions. Now, I'm not saying that Warren Buffett necessarily sells options, although in my last seminar someone pointed out to me that he did actually have some sort of short option trade going on. But with that said, um, this quote is fabulous, and it, it applies to option trading. Be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. It's a really simple rule of thumb. Unfortunately, most people do the exact opposite. If the herd is buying calls, that might be a time to sell calls, not buying. If you, know, if you hear about uh, – if you turn on the TV and you hear a story about a corn drought and corn calls are being bought up and corn's limit up that day, that's probably not the time to buy a call. That's probably the time as an option seller to consider at least selling a call, right? Look for some deep out of the monies. I'm not saying jump in front of a freight train, but sometimes you can get some really high probability trades off of those types of things. Okay, you want to, when you're trading, obviously, you want to look at volatility and velocity and pricing. Most traders understand the concept of options in low buying options in low volatility and selling them in, in high volatility. But as we just said, emotions often get in the way of execution and result in the exact opposite. In quiet markets, option sellers tend to get frustrated at the profits that they're missing out on. They feel like if they don't have a trade on, they're, you know, they're losing opportunities. In volatile markets, Traders often panic and liquidate at the worst possible time. So this is just, these are just some things that we have to be aware of ourselves 
and try to manage them. Um, for instance, you know, we do, uh, we tend to recommend strangles in crude oil quite often, but one thing you have to be really, really careful about in crude oil is it's the type of market that can explode on a dime. Something happens in the Middle East or even something uh, economically here at home, you can see some really big moves in crude, and sometimes it, it moves just for no reason. So what you really want to be careful selling crude options if, if the market's quiet. There have been times where, um, you know, I mean, ideally in a perfect world, we'd like to sell strangles once a month or once every two months and consistently have them on, but it just isn't a good idea all the time. There's been times where we skip four, five, six months because you know what? It's just too quiet. And while it's frustrating to see that, darn, our strangles would have worked in the last three or four months and we just missed out on that, guess what? It only takes that one crazy move that usually happens in a day or two days that, you know, to wipe everything out. So it's better to just sit on the sidelines. If you're missing a couple trades, so what? At least you know there's no stress, right? There's no stress on the sideline. In my opinion, the goal of a short option trader should be to enter a position after most people are panicking. You do not want to be in a position in, that it will leave you open to, to panic. We all make bad decisions when we're panicking. You know, we're scared, we're frustrated, we don't want to lose more money, and we panic and we do the exact wrong thing. It just it happens. So the easiest way to avoid that is to simply don't put yourself in that situation. I'm saying, you know, you can do everything – in, in your power to avoid that type of situation. It's going to happen eventually, but you can really cut down the frequency of it by just doing a few very simple things. And we'll show you those uh, shortly. But the idea is if, if you do this, it typically increases the odds of success because you're collecting more premium and you're mitigating the chances of becoming panic stricken. So if you're selling options when other people are panic buying them, you're probably one step ahead of them in most cases. The only time I can think of when maybe that wasn't the case was in 2008 when the market just there was no bottom in sight. But, you know, those types of things don't happen very often. And so we can't uh, – the one thing we can't do is assume that that's going to repeat itself over and over and over again because, let's be honest, that was probably – uh, a once in a, you know, maybe even once in a decade or maybe even a longer time period type of event. So, and really, uh, the less thinking, like if, if you're if you're selling options when others are panicking, you're collecting more premium, you're bettering your odds, and you know what? You're not putting yourself in a position to second guess yourself, and that's really a big a big luxury. Now, obviously, good timing for option sellers is really the same as futures, futures traders. Uh, ideally, you want to anticipate a price reversal or a significant shift in volatility. It's easy to say. It's not as easy to do. Uh, you know, too bad we don't get the Wall Street Journal a day in advance. But let's take a look at a, a trade example. And this is how important timing is. I know that I, I mentioned before, option sellers have lots of room for error. They don't have to have perfect timing, and all of those things are true. However, timing helps a lot, and timing is important in keeping your emotions out of the game, and here's how. Let's say on uh, this hypothetical day, a trader could have sold a 136 call, we'll say on April 2nd, uh, for about 18 ticks or $281. You know, you could see why a trader might want to do that. You pull up the chart. It looks like the odds of it getting to 136 aren't super, super great. There's some resistance here, uh, trend line. And so fundamentally, probably not a horrible trade. But what, what is horrible is the timing of it all. This is April 2nd, by the way, this arrow. If you're, if you're trying to tell yourself this market's in a downtrend, it's a good time to sell a call. Remember what I said, you're selling calls off the discount rack. So it's a risky, risky game. Sometimes it's going to work, but if it doesn't, it's going to be very painful. Now, let's show you what might have happened if you were a little more patient. Had you decided to sell that call not on April 2nd, but on April 11th, things look a lot different on April 11th. 
we're no longer in a downtrend. Now we're in an uptrend. And guess what? That same call is worth 53 ticks or $828. So you're collecting roughly three times the amount just for waiting a week. See what a difference timing can make? And on top of that, the break even of the trade is a lot more comfortable. It's now 136.26. Before, it was 136.18. So you're talking about the difference would be somewhere, if you see my cursor there, someone, somewhere in here. So, I mean, that's a pretty decent size uh, difference for your break even. And not to mention, you collected a heck of a lot more premium. So it's a lot more lucrative of a trade. So timing does matter, even as an option seller. Even though you have room for error, timing does matter. Now here's a third scenario. Uh, the same trader, had he waited to the second date to sell right here on the upswing, he could have decided, well, I no longer want to sell the 136. I think I'm going to sell a 138 for 22. So this trader, just by waiting, let's see, like four or five, six days, whatever that is, he collected a little more premium to sell an option two full points further from the market. It's a much safer trade. The break even for this trade would be uh, 38.11. So we're talking a massive difference in the odds of success in a trade like this. Now, someone might say yes, but how do, the market didn't, there was no guarantee the market would have went from here to here. And that's absolutely true. If the market would have continued lower, we would have missed the trade. But you know what? I don't care. I would rather miss trades than chase trades. And if you chase trades, you could be this person. You sell your call here, and next thing you know, it's worth three times what you sold it for. Whoops, I'm sorry, I got uh, that bigger there. Okay, so all three of these trades would have worked out, but the first trade was vulnerable to question, margin call, and you might have just thrown in the towel. You might have said, forget about it. I don't want to be in this trade anymore. So you may not have been able to hold on long enough to actually reap the reward. The second and third trades offered more profit potential and better odds of success. So timing is everything, even in option selling, and it does wonders for reducing the stress levels. Okay, it's not enough for a market to rally. You also need velocity behind the move. The speed of the rally is just as important as the breadth. In order for call premiums to inflate and to become attractive, there must be a considerable amount of momentum. So, for example, if the S&P rallies 20 handles over two weeks, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good time to sell calls. Even though the market's overbought and it looks like, you know, we're at the upper end of the, the trading range, the options are still going to be cheap. But if the S&P rallies 20 handles in a day and we're up at the top end of the trading range, that's when it might be a good time to sell options because everybody else is panic buying. They're panicking because they're not in or they're panicking because they want to be longer. So they're buying calls and those options get expensive. And that's when an option seller might want to step in and take a look. Okay, there is much more to option selling than waiting for high volatility and entering the market. You really have to be aware of support and resistance levels. And that sounds obvious, but that's a big mistake that a lot of traders make. Um, First thing you want to do is determine whether or not a market's overbought or oversold. Like, as a counter-trend trader, I like to sell, sell call options in a market that's overbought or put options in a market that's oversold. There's never going to be any guarantees, but in general, if in a market's already overextended, it will usually pause or maybe even pull back. Even a pause would, lower, would allow the option premium to erode. So it doesn't necessarily take a full-on reversal for an option seller to make money. The market just needs to stop going up as fast as it is. You should really pick out your own indicators and determine what you know works for you. But I tend to look at RSI, stochastics, and percent R up here. Um, and you'll notice, you know, a lot of them are really. My view on oscillators is really, in the long run, they're all kind of the same. Some are faster, some are slower, but they're all going to really have the same similar performance. So don't fall in love with one, but pick a handful that you like and, and kind of use them. 
Uh, percent R is a little bit quicker. You'll notice this, it, it gave an overbought signal a lot faster than some of the others. So what I do is I take a, a quicker signal like RSI and say that's kind of my get ready stage. And then I look for one of the other indicators to corroborate it. And this isn't all I look at. I mean, I'm looking at seasonals and all kinds of other stuff, but this, this will give you some good pointers. You really don't want to be uh, selling options until you've got some technical indicators that are telling you you're overbought or oversold. Unless you're doing strangles, which are non-directional in that case, that's a different story. But I'm strictly talking about um, trying to sell against the trend. So for example, this is a uh, treasury bonds. You can see this might have been a good time to sell calls. And I know it's easy to say after the fact, of course, you know, it worked out well. But, um, you know, you can't deny that it, it kind of works, so. You really want to take a look at uh, volatility as well. Obviously, we want to take a look at volatility, but let me tell you, there's, there's actually two different types of volatility, and people get confused over this. Um, there's historical volatility, which is actually the volatility right now in the futures prices in real time, okay? And then there's implied volatility, which is really more of the market's expectations of volatility going forward. The, the implied volatility is not necessarily an indicator, but it's built into the option pricing. So um, you'll notice like for, for example, if um, a market's been moving pretty quickly, traders will start buying calls and buying puts because they're expecting volatility to stay elevated or increase, and so it bids up the price of the options. If traders bid the price enough, the implied volatility, which is part of the price of the options, reaches levels that are usually unsustainable. If there's high probability, I mean, I'm sorry, if there's high implied volatility built into the options, it suggests the market is looking for some massive swings. And, but keep this in mind, implied volatility is directly dependent on human emotions, and it can cause options to become irrationally priced based on the true reality or probability of a particular outcome. Implied volatility is what keeps options selling in business. If it wasn't for implied volatility, none of us would be here, but it is, and so we are. I believe that implied volatility is a more important indicator to option traders than historic volatility because it's somewhat forward-looking. Implied volatility will increase before major economic releases. Um, and sometimes this is a good time to sell options. It seems kind of crazy. Um, for example, if we see like non-farm payrolls coming out on, you know, um, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, if, if non-farm payrolls is coming up, you'll notice two, maybe three days before the event, option prices tend to pick up a little value, and that's even if the futures price isn't moving at all. And that's because traders are getting positioned. They're buying calls, they're buying puts, they're bidding the values up because they think there might be a big, some sort of big spike in volatility on the news. Sometimes there is, but more often than not, there is not. I've seen bond options actually lose value despite a huge reaction in the futures market. I've seen, um, I'm trying to remember what month it was. It had to be four, five months ago. But uh, bonds sold off about two full handles, two full points on a, a Fed day. Or maybe it was non-farm payrolls, one or the other. And the put options actually lost value. So you want to be really careful about buying options going into a big event because the market's already priced in volatility and they're priced to lose. So sometimes it's actually better to look at those types of events and look for places to sell options because there's even more room for error than would normally be the case. Now, the one awesome thing about CQG that most platforms don't have is you can actually plot the implied volatility of the option, if you notice right here, implied volatility. Now keep in mind, the implied volatility is different for each individual option. But what CQG does is it takes kind of the at the money option and then plots that level. So that way you can see uh, the futures volatility, which is up here, versus the option volatility. And you can get an idea of are, are the options overpriced? Is the market 
panicking. And if they're panicking, that's like I said before, when you want to start looking at things, um, you'll notice Like in certain situations, you'll see uh, the futures volatility is probably a little more panic stricken than the options and so on and so forth. This, uh, you'll notice the futures volatility here is basically flatline. There's not a lot going on, but the options are moving. I would guess, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but I would guess this is probably going into a Fed meeting or something like that uh, where the volatility is actually increasing a little bit. But you, you'll notice the price is also increasing. So. Uh, maybe not. One thing to keep in mind that's uh, kind of off the subject, but you hear people talk about the VIX all the time. The VIX is in, a, in its very simplest form. It's kind of the implied volatility of the S&P options. The VIX tends to go up when volatility goes up. But when, when you're talking about VIX volatility and S&P volatility, you're talking about selling off. I mean, if the, if the S&P is up 40 points in a single day, the VIX doesn't go up. Even though you, you would think it would, its volatility should go up, right? No, it doesn't. But if the S&P is down $40, the VIX will probably go up pretty sharply. Bonds are the opposite. Implied volatility in bonds goes up when bonds go up and down when bonds go down, usually. So it's kind of the volatility in bonds is the opposite of volatility in the S&P. As an option seller, you need to be aware of the volatility skew. I'll, I'm gonna show you a chart in a minute, but the, the thing you wanna really know is at the money options are going to have less implied volatility than deep out of the money options. And if this sounds great for option sellers because as an option seller, you want implied volatility, right? Because that's extra premium and with low, low odds of uh, something happening. And that's true, but you want to be really careful with that. It's a double-edged sword. And I'll show you why in just a minute. Um, well, I'll... ideally, I'm, I'm going to try to explain this without uh, encouraging you to do this, but ideally, when you're selling options further from the market, you're probably taking on a little less risk because the odds of the, the futures market getting to your strike price are less than they would be if you were selling closer to the money options because the market simply would have to travel further. So this is absolutely true. However, sell, a lot of people, what they will do is they'll sell deeper out of the money options and collect less premium for them because the odds are, are better than closer to the money options. But there's a caveat. If you're selling higher quantities or if you're selling more options to get more premium because they're cheaper than the closer, closer than the monies, you might actually be taking on more risk and be prone to more volatility than you would if you were selling lower quantities closer to the money. And that's because of the volatility skew. We'll look at this here. What this really means is the deeper out of the money options are going to move faster than the close to the money on a percentage basis than a cl the close to the monies. And you can, uh, these are calls on this side and these are puts on this side. And the reason it's like that is you can imagine, um, like for example, I'm not even sure these options are listed. This is just more of a, an academic thing, but the bond, this is a bond, these are on bond options. The market's at around 134 at this time. So a 110 put, the odds of the market getting from 134 to 110 are probably slim to none. So an option like this is probably nearly worthless. It might only be worth a tick, okay? The odds of it getting to 110 are slim, but if you're selling an option for a tick or two ticks, it, the market doesn't necessarily have to get anywhere near 110. If it goes to 120, your option might be worth 10, 20 times what you sold it for. So that's what I'm talking about, be careful with implied volatility. My strategy or my way of looking at things is I like being somewhere here in the sweet spot, okay? I think um, selling lower quantity but a little closer to the money works better for me because I don't like to see my options. If I sell an option for 100 bucks, I don't want to see it worth $1,000 the next day because of some little minuscule move 
or news announcement. I would prefer to sell one option a little closer to the money. And sure, I, it, it's very possible that I sell an option for three, four, five hundred bucks and it doubles in value or more, but it's a lot easier to handle one option than it is 20, 30, 40, 50. Now, this is just my opinion. I, there's lots of people out there selling deep out of the money options and they probably do very well with it, but you have to have a certain type of personality to be able to stomach that sort of volatility because it can be extremely volatile out there on the ends, on the wings. Okay, CQG has this awesome feature that will actually allow you to try to predict what the value of an option would be based on a, a futures move. <clears throat> so uh, I, hopefully you can see this. I'm not sure how clear it is, but I'll just kind of read it out to you. You have uh, basically an input section where the actuals, which is um, shows green right here, the actuals, this is where the market actually is. And we're talking about a June 136 call in Treasury bonds. And again, this was a few months ago. The markets have moved a little bit. But um, anyway, the, the futures price at this point was at 133.29, so we'll just call it 134. So two points away from the strike price of this option. The value of the option was 30, which is roughly, we'll just call it 500 bucks. So a trader could have collected about $500 for, the, for a, an option, two points out of the money. Now that trader might wonder, well, what's going to happen if the market goes to 136 in the next couple of days? And you'll see the days to expiry here. We start with 32 days to expiry, and we input it just to see what would happen, 30 days. So if in two days the market goes up to our strike price, what's our option going to be worth? and it calculates it for us. It tells us 109, which is a little over a thousand bucks. Obviously, that's not what we want to see as an option seller. If we sell something for 500, we don't want it to be worth a thousand a few days later. That's pretty dramatic. But this is a great little tool to kind of just give you a feel for how things are going to work before you actually enter the trade. Now, with that said, let me just explain a couple of things. This is uh, this tool here that CQG offers. It's calculating estimates based on what you may or may not be losing before option expiration. And it's, a, it's not necessarily an exact science. Um, the value of an option before expiration is almost impossible to accurately predict because we don't know what the volatility is going to be. We don't know exactly what the timing is going to be. I mean, we inputted two days. We said the market's going to go to 136 in two days. But what if it does it in four? Or what if it does it in six? You know what I mean? We can't estimate what's going to happen in the future. So you're never going to get uh, – you can't predict the future. Let's just put it that way. But with that said, this is an awesome way to get an idea of how your option is going to react to the market. On the other hand, if the futures price is – if we're talking about at expiration, it's really easy to determine what the value of your option would be. At expiration, it's very simple. If the market's below your strike price, this is the strike price of uh, 136, the option expires worthless. So this entire line is depicting that. If the market is above 136, then you're facing unlimited losses, almost like a futures contract. So. At expiration, the payoff diagram is a very simple single line and there's no guessing. It is what it is. Before expiration, there's a lot of guesswork, but CQG can, can help you with that. Now, we also ran uh, a test to see what would happen if the futures price stays steady. With all else being equal, will the options erode over time? And as we suspect, which is why we like this strategy, they did. So we started with 32 days to expiration. We typed in 10, which meant 22 days went by. And the futures price really hasn't gone anywhere. It's unrealistic to say that the futures price is not going to move at all in 20 days. But it's not uncommon for it to be in the same place in 20 days. It'll usually rally a little bit and then sell off a little bit. And then it might just come right back. So it's not out of the question. But this is a good demonstration to show you just how quickly options can erode. In that 22 days, the option is now only worth about four ticks. So, for, I mean, we'll just, we're just doing rough math, but you sold the option for approximately 500 bucks. It's now worth like 60. 
like four or five ticks. So, I mean, that gives you a pretty good idea. Somebody that bought that option, they weren't wrong and they weren't right. The market didn't go anywhere. It just went nowhere. But because the timing didn't work out for them, they're basically running out of time and they lost money. And again, that's why it's nice to be a seller because you can, you don't have to be right. You don't have to be wrong. You just have to have time go by without being really, really wrong. Okay, There's, we're going to take a quick uh, look at a few quick rules that you should uh, consider when selling options. Here's a couple of my favorites. Let the market decide how much premium you can collect. Don't look at the option chain and say, okay, this option has a, this is an expensive option. I want to collect 500 bucks, so that's the strike price I'm going to sell. Don't do that. Let the market determine how much you can collect. And if you don't like what you see, then don't sell the option. You. First, you want to, you know, look at support and resistance. You don't want to sell options here or here. You want to sell them up here, right? You want to sell them below support, down here. You don't want to sell them here because the odds of you getting in trouble on an option that is above support or below resistance is pretty good. Even if you end up being right eventually, you're either going to have to suffer a drawdown, you're going to give yourself some mental anguish, and, um, you might not even last. You might force, you know, you might run out of margin or you might liquidate in panic. So it's never a good idea. One of the great features of CQG options is that you can look at multiple months on a single sheet of, uh, of paper. Most option chains, I shouldn't say paper, on a single screen. Most option chains will let you look at Mays and then you have to toggle to Junes and go from there. You could, if you really had a big enough screen and you had enough room, you could look at several months all at the same time in CQG. So that's pretty cool. Um, and when you're shopping around, like I said, first look at the futures chart and determine where support resistance is. And then once you determine appropriate strike prices to sell, go and see if there's enough premium there. If not, forget about it. Go to a different market, look at something else. It's not worth doing. So Somebody that would have looked at the chart before that we were looking at might pull up the June calls and look at the premium. And uh, honestly, they might they might consider bypassing the trade. But if 22 ticks is enough for them, then then go for it. The worst thing they could do is try to to squeeze in a few extra ticks, sell something for a little more premium, but get below resistance and above support it dramatically lowers your odds of success. Take it from me. If a market gives you a gift, just take it. Don't ask questions. Don't pat yourself on the back and talk about how, you know, how much of a genius you are. Sometimes, it, you know, it's better to be lucky than good. If we're in the right place at the right time, take the money. Don't push it. Don't get greedy. My rule of thumb is if a short option loses about 80% of its value, I think you should just buy it back. A lot of people will will let it hold its expiration and try to squeeze out that 20%, but keep in mind, an option that's eroded most of its value is still a lot of margin. It's still a lot of risk. I've seen options go from you know, $50 to hundreds or thousands of dollars in a couple of days, and the you know people that were short those options just trying to squeeze out that last 50 bucks ended up with a big loser on their hands. It's just not worth it, trust me. You can always buy it back and look for a new trade. In our, you know, in our opinion, we like to start looking or pricing things out. Once an option loses 60% of the value, sometimes we'll throw in good till canceled orders to liquidate them at an anticipated exit price. Um, or another thing is, if it happens real quickly, if we lose 50 or 60% of our option value in a week or two, when there's still five or six weeks left on the options, we'll just take it. If we've made 50% of the money in two weeks and we have to hold another five or six weeks to get the other 50%, it just doesn't make sense to do that. Take the money and move on to the next trade. Trust me when I say there are better ways to make money in the markets than avoiding offsetting of a short option to make a few extra bucks. Just because an option is cheap does not mean that there is an unlimited risk in danger. We never know what's going to happen tomorrow, and things can change really quickly. Just 
remember the sidelines is a position. A lot of option sellers trade on the assumption that time is money and being flat means you're missing out on profits because as we've been telling you all day, options are an eroding asset. So if a lot of people think if they're on the sidelines, they're missing out on that erosion. And that's true, but you have to look at a few things also. The more time that's spent with open options, the greater the odds of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Also, standing aside enables traders to attempt to take advantage of explosions in price or volatility. We argue that less is more when selling options. I always, I always tell my clients, I would rather be on the sidelines wishing that I was in than in wishing that I was on the sidelines. It's far better to miss a trade or to miss out on a few dollars in, in trading profits than to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So to wrap things up, uh, option sellers face favorable odds. Don't forget about timing, well-timed counter trend entries, shift the break even point and reduce the emotional impact of the trade. But keep in mind, favorable odds don't guarantee profits. Option sellers must be able to manage their risk and react quickly to adverse moves. It's not free money here. We, we have to be nimble and we have to accept when we're wrong. The key to option selling is not to let the small percentage of losing trades wipe out profits of the winners or even an entire trading account. And I've unfortunately seen that happen. Again, option selling isn't for everybody. Be sure you have the capital and the mindset to accept unlimited risk. I want to thank you all for coming. I hope that you got something out of it. And if you have any questions, uh, we'd be more than happy to, to go over those with you. If you're interested in any of the things we learned today or even learning more about trading, I've uh, written three books. You'll find them here. Trader's first book on commodities, currency trading, and commodity options. They're available anywhere, but Amazon is usually cheapest. Here's my email address if, if you have questions beyond uh, what we've talked about today. Feel free to give me a call. Okay, Carly, thank you very much for your presentation. I've um, got a couple of questions okay. here. Uh, one, okay. question, one person is um, asking about your use of the technical indicators in that they're you know, basically looking at the history and seem a little risky about forward looking. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, that is exactly right. You're, um, I couldn't have said it better myself. The thing about technical indicators is they, they only calculate historical data. They can't tell the future, but that's true of, of anything. So I would never recommend that anybody trade only on, on the chart. Although, I mean, the way I like to tell people is like when I analyze a market, I probably use about 70% charts. Um, and then the other 30% is fundamental market sentiment, seasonals you know, and all these other little things. So you don't ever want to go 100% on, on technical because you're absolutely right. When you're looking at stochastics or our, our RSI, those types of things, it's telling you what has happened, not what's going to happen. But more often than not, uh, they will give us a clue into whether or not a move is exhausted. And so that's what we're looking for. It's not necessarily what's going to happen in the future, but maybe what won't happen in the future. Okay, um, thank you. Um, another question is about um, CQG uh, asking if we can enter custom option spreads where you have the same underlying asset, same expiration, but different strike prices, and the answer to that is yes. Um, do you use the Chaikin Money Flow Indicator or the Ichimoku Cloud by chance? Uh, I do not use those particular um, indicators. I, I mean, I use, uh, I do look at at Bollinger Bands, just to kind of, the great thing about Bollinger Bands is it'll show um, volatility on a chart. It's very visual. You don't have to do much thinking. You'll see, you know, if the Bollinger Bands are narrow, you can see low volatility. If they're, if they're wide, you see the volatility is high. And those are kind of similar to the same idea as the uh, Ichimoku Cloud or whatever they call it, but I don't, I don't use that one specifically, no. Uh -huh. um, and we have some questions that are actually not really within the scope, uh, but Everyone uh, who's interested in the advanced analytics package in CQG can contact their uh, uh, sales rep and they can get um, a free two-week trial of the advanced options package. Uh, it is not available in the 
QTrader, but with IC. And if you don't have CQG IC, you can also get a free two-week trial of uh, CQG Integrated Client and the two-week free trial of the options, advanced options package, and you can test those things out now. A um, couple more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you use for your support and resistance indicators? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I'm I am a very very simple person. <laughs> I just mm -hmm. I use trend lines and I look at. Uh, you know, volatility levels. If in a high volatility market, I, I just assume the stops, buy stops and sell stops are going to get run, and so I kind of estimate, you know, where the market might be if that happens. Um, mm -hmm. But I keep it really simple, simple trend lines. I do, you know, Fibonacci every once in a while, but nothing too complex. Uh, classic technical analysis then. Right. Um, the other question is about, you, you know, your guideline about managing a losing position. You know, what mm -hmm. at what point do you want to close it out? Okay, great question. Um, I usually draw the line in the sand around, uh, I call it a double out rule. So like for for instance, if we collect $500 for an option and it becomes worth 1000 we usually will at least start shopping around for an adjustment. We won't always because sometimes, um, sometimes if a market is really overstretched and we're up against support or resistance and there's a pretty – good chance that things are going to at least pause or turn around. We won't just blindly buy an option back because it's doubled in value, but we will at least start shopping around so that we're ready to act if it doesn't start getting better soon. Um, but that's kind of the line in the sand is doubling out. Okay. This uh, concludes our webinar. Thank you again, Carly. As I mentioned at the start, anybody uh, who res registered for the webinar will also receive a link to the recorded version. Again, thank you, Carly, and thank you, everyone else, for attending this webinar. Have a good evening. Thanks a lot. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.